You're listening to Drug Positive, the risk reduction and benefit enhancement podcast, reducing shame and stigma to save lives and end the drug war. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the new decade where we're going to see an end to the drug war or at least the decriminalization of drugs. Yes, that's right. This is the decade we're going to do it. And bittersweet will it be because it's going to happen just in time for the beginning of the end of the world. You know what I'm talking about. We're only two weeks into the roaring 20s and the fires in Australia have killed over a billion animals. World War III almost started, and billionaires are now paying less in taxes than you and me. So let's work hard together, everyone, to end this drug war because, well, we're going to seriously need drugs to handle the shit that's coming down over the next 10 years. Nah, I'm just kidding. No, actually, I'm not kidding. (laughs) Well, I'm not kidding about the end of the world, but I am kidding about the need to use drugs to handle it. At least, that's not the way I use drugs. This whole notion of numbing yourself, your mind, to escape your problems. Hey, let's not judge. For some, that might be a fine way to cope, at least for a short period of time. But that's not for me. I don't want to numb myself. Now, or for the coming collapse of civilization, I want to go down fighting. So when the millions of coastal residents start fleeing inland from rising sea levels and corporate capitalism has no way of handling them, and the capitalists and libertarians just can't bring themselves to transition to a democratic socialist system that works for everybody, and they decide to just kill the poor or let us die, well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to fight back. I'm going to take my magic mushrooms and with my army of psychedelic socialist warriors, we're going to raid their motherfucking gated communities and either make a revolution or die trying. Are you with me? And to be honest, we better start now before the floods, because the rich, they've already started. Trump and Biden, they're preparing for climate catastrophe, and their solution is to amass as much power as they can, wall themselves off with high-tech security, and let the rest of us die. Or kill us. Don't believe it? This is actually what happens historically when societies fail. It always has. Whether the result of war or environmental collapse, when the state breaks down, it gets replaced either by authoritarian strongmen and warlords or, on occasion, by cooperative social arrangements. So, which one do you want? If you're young enough, this is your lifetime. Or, could be your kid's lifetime. And we gotta start preparing now. Cooperative social structures take a long time to organize, and once the crisis starts, fearful, desperate people will be more likely to rally around the warlords. Look, we may not be able to prevent climate change, but we can mitigate the worst aspects of political and economic collapse if we say no right now to the corporate capitalists. And don't think that means simply voting out Trump. The corporate Democrats like Joe Biden work for the same people. Biden is bought and owned by the same class of psychopaths that gave Jeffrey Epstein a final teenager in prison and then conveniently erased the surveillance footage of his murder. Come on, you know it's true. Some conspiracies are real. Maybe not chemtrails, don't believe that one. But the rich fucking over the poor, blackmailing politicians from both parties by getting videos of them having sex with underage children, you know that's true. Everybody knows it. That was Epstein's role. It's called managed democracy. The rich control the empire they always have. From CNN to Fox, from Facebook to Cambridge Analytica. George Carlin knows it. I'm talking about the real owners now. The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. It's a big club and you ain't in it. You and I are not in the big club. Oh man, what a way to start the first episode of the 20s. But what does any of this have to do with vaping? Well, I'll tell you. Because here we are in 2020 at the beginning of the decade that is destined to shatter all the lies and illusions of the empire. And with all the shit happening, 
from World War III to 5G, there's one thing crazier than all of it, something I never would have predicted, and that is cannabis has started killing people. Can you believe that? Okay, not exactly cannabis, but in this episode, we're going to learn about vaping-associated pulmonary injury, or vapey. And why it is that within the last 12 months, more than 2,400 people have gotten seriously sick and 52 have died after vaping cannabis. That's right. For the first time in history, cannabis consumption is killing people. We started hearing about it last summer, remember, when all the big news outlets were reporting it. The CDC made a public announcement and it was front page news for a while. They didn't know what was causing it, so they just put out this blanket announcement that there was some new mystery disease afflicting people who vaped. And if you were like me, maybe you were skeptical. Is this another popcorn lung type scare tactic being pumped out by big tobacco in order to turn people away from nicotine vapes? Are the drug warriors concocting more lies in order to roll back all the progress we've made around cannabis legalization? Either of those would have been plausible, right? But as it turns out, Vapey is real. Some people have known about it for a long time, and they knew the cause as well. Vitamin E acetate, also known as tocopherol acetate, started to be added to illicit vape cartridges in mass in 2018. And it damages the lungs. So much so that if you inhale enough of it, you can die. It's used as a thickening agent by illicit manufacturers of vape cartridges in order to dilute the cannabis oil, fool the customer, and increase their profits. And if you own one of these pens, listen up here, if you own a disposable cannabis vape pen and you don't know for sure that it was bought in a licensed store in a state where cannabis is legal, then you need to throw it out right now. Four out of five cannabis vape pens in the U.S. today are black market pens, and the chances are high that they contain tocopherol acetate. You don't want to be breathing that shit, so throw it away. Break the pen and toss it in the trash right now. In this episode, I interview David Downs, the California editor of Leafly.com. Leafly is the best news source I know of covering all things related to cannabis, and David Downs has been a cannabis journalist for almost 10 years. Before joining Leafly, he was the cannabis editor for the San Francisco Chronicle. Super smart guy, and this is an amazing interview. You're going to love it, and you're going to learn a lot. It was actually an article David wrote in September that first clued me into what was really going on with vaping-associated pulmonary injury. He knew it long before the CDC did. I did this interview a month ago in mid-December, and my apologies for it taking so long to release, because this is really a timely issue. But... I took a bit of a break for the holidays, if you can call it that, because really what I've been doing is caring for my friend Amy, who just had gender confirmation surgery. And as you can imagine, getting a vagina for the first time is pretty fucking major. And so actually, I'm still caring for Amy. In fact, we arrived just yesterday in New Mexico, where I live. She lives in California, but she didn't have a good place to convalesce out there. So she's going to do it here with me for the next month or so. In any case, it's never too late to release an episode, and so here it is. And you know what I love about this episode the most? It gives me the perfect opportunity to rail against libertarianism. I really can't think of a better situation than Vapey to point out the ridiculousness of believing that unregulated markets are a solution to anything. Here we have the safest drug in the world, and as soon as the market opens up even a little, people start dying. Of course, prohibition is still playing a role in all this, but this is precisely because in those states where cannabis is still prohibited, there are no regulations governing the purity of vaping products. And it's precisely this lack of regulation that allows manufacturers to add vitamin E acetate to vape cartridges and dealers to get away with selling them. In the states where vape cartridges have to be tested for purity or potency before they can be sold, like California and Colorado, vaping-associated pulmonary injuries are 10 times lower than in prohibition states. And there have been zero confirmed vapey cases associated with a licensed store or licensed product. Every single death or illness has come from an unregulated product, and 90% of those products were bought in prohibition states with no regulations. It's almost as if 
no regulations, and prohibition are the same thing. Huh, imagine that. I mean, think about it. Functionally speaking, prohibition isn't really about the government preventing the sale of a drug. When has prohibition ever accomplished that, right? Drugs have always been around. So if prohibition doesn't actually prohibit the sale of drugs, then what does it do? Prohibition functionally is really just the refusal of government to regulate a safe drug supply, allowing instead the truly free market to manufacture and sell whatever it wants. Prohibition, in other words, is functional libertarianism. It creates so-called free markets without government interference. And the vapey crisis is the result. Prohibition is libertarianism. Legalization is regulation. Think about that, all you libertarian ideologues out there. <laughs> oh, this is so much fun. I could do this forever. But we really should get to the interview. But before we do, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. I first met Amy Morrill in 2014 when I filmed her and a group of her friends in Los Angeles having an ecstasy house party. She later moved to Grass Valley, where I was living at the time, and we really got to know each other. She is one of the kindest, most non-judgmental people I know. She brings joy into every room she enters. And I know that's a cliche that you usually say about people who have died, but Amy is still alive today and I'm saying it. You can't be in a room with her for more than a minute without becoming happier. And two weeks ago today, actually, she got a vagina. So <laughs> say hello to Amy, everyone. We're just going to have a short chat because I want you to meet her. Hi, Amy. Hi, Emmanuel. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling a little rough around the edges, but getting better day by day and starting to feel a little more like myself. Okay, well, you look really cozy lying in bed there. Well, it's my only option is, is bed rest, so I try to be as comfy as possible. Okay, so I gave a little intro about you earlier in my opening monologue, but maybe you can tell people, what did you just go through? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I just went through um, a, a gender reassignment surgery or gender confirmation surgery that I've been wanting to have my entire life. And the opportunity over the last few years presented itself. And, and here I am. Two weeks later, I have my girly bits that I've always wanted. And they're lovely and... Like, I just can't wait to be all healed up and feeling really good about it all soon. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Are there any details you might want to tell a wide audience about? People might be interested, but it's also a very private thing for you, so it's totally up to you. I mean, it is a very private thing to look the world in a microphone and say, hi, I have a pussy. <laughs> We're two weeks out from the surgery today. Is it still hurt? Well, I've been on a lot of meds ever since the surgery. I've been reducing and reducing and reducing. And this morning was the first time I woke up around 4 a.m. I've been waking up around 4 a.m. every morning to go to the bathroom. And this morning was the first morning I didn't take anything to get back to sleep. Oh, good. That's great. Yeah, but I just took some pain meds now for some pain because I'm, I'm feeling it. What uh, what drugs have you been taking post surgery, and how have they been affecting you? Well, I really like drugs, so there's a uh, few limits on what I might choose to take. But what I've been what I've been prescribed is Norco, which is uh, ten three twenty five hydrocodone acetaminophen, and the doctor prescribed me um, the generic for Valium to help me sleep and stay calm and and that's helped quite a bit. And also I've been supplementing my Norcos with Kratom because the Norcos alone wouldn't prove enough pain relief on their own. Well, if you want to avoid poisoning yourself with the acetaminophen. With the acetaminophen that destroys livers in a month. Yeah. If you wanna if I wanted to spend two months Eating those like candy, yeah, I could do some serious uh, acute kidney damage, kidney injury. 
I've actually been really impressed at your uh, moderation on the Norcas. I probably would be taking more than you've been taking, but you've been really good at limiting those. So you're taking Kratom. Can you tell which kind of Kratom it was? And, you know, does it feel just like an opiate or what? Well, the one I have is, is called a green vein Kratom or green kratom, and there's a few different kinds. There's a red vein, and there's a white kratom, and apparently they all have slightly different psychoactive effects. The green one that I've been taking is is the one that's supposedly best for analgesic effects and, you know, for pain relief and to, to just keep you just like kind of like the... You know, I'm high. I'm I'm in I'm in pain relief mode. And I can confirm that you've been kind of in pain relief mental state for a bit, uh, especially the first week after your surgery. I don't even think you you can remember some of the conversations we had or some of the crazy incidents that took place. It's probably good that you're not remembering. Well, there were certainly some instances in the hospital they gave me um, dilaudid, um, and they were giving me two milligrams um, liquid every hour. That was through your IV? Through my IV. Plus, I had a little button as well where I could get 0.2 milligrams more every six minutes. And I have to say, you were still a big complainer. It hurt. I believe you, but that's a high dose. I talked to a surgeon friend of mine who told me that that was a super high dose, and I couldn't believe you were on the super, the highest dose that they give people, and all you were doing was complaining about the pain. I was really worried about you for a while, wondering if there had been some kind of mistake in your surgery and was relieved when the surgeon, when I met and talked to him privately, and he said, no, 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 everything's fine. She just has a very low pain tolerance. I see. Um, The princess in the pea, Amy. Well, I am the princess in the pea. (laughs) <laughs> yes, you are. Um, well, Amy, it's really been a joy taking care of you, a privilege and a joy, even though it's been hard sometimes. And we got another month together, so maybe um, I'll invite you back on this show to talk more about drugs, because I, you and I have had a lot of fun drug experiences together. Maybe we'll even do some drugs and get on the show. Would you like that? I'd like that very much. I think you need to wait a little bit. You don't want to do anything that increases your blood pressure. You want to kind of be feeling a bit better. But maybe in a couple weeks, we could uh, trip and record it. In a few weeks, I think that'd be perfect. Anything else you want to say to people? Yeah, I just want to say I love you, Emmanuel, and thanks for taking care of me. I'm my most vulnerable and most important part of my life. Well, I'm so proud of you. You're so courageous, and I'm so happy for you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Bye. Bye. So that was Amy, everyone, and I'm sure we'll hear more from her soon. Oh, and if you want to write to her or write to me for any reason, the email address of Drug Positive is drugpositive at gmail.com. And don't forget my Patreon. I rely totally on my Patreon subscribers for financial support so I can keep producing these shows. Just go to patreon.com slash drug positive or just Google us and you'll see it. Uh, Okay, let's get to the interview. You know, I first learned about vitamin E acetate as the cause of vaping-associated pulmonary injury in September after reading an article by my guest, David Downs. And yet, it wasn't until November when the CDC announced this. So, I began the interview by asking David why he thinks it took the CDC so long to figure it out. Listen to this, everyone. It's going to blow you away. Hi, David. Thank you for being on the show. It's great to have you here. Hi, Emmanuel. Thanks for having me. So the first question I had for you is, what took the CDC so long when you report in September that public health officials, maybe local or state ones, knew about this back in July? I think most people think of the CDC like they've seen in movies and like hot zone and you got people sitting around a big room with screens tracking, you know, global pandemics. And when vapey popped up, that they would be on it. The reality is that cannabis extraction and vaping and vaporizers and innovation in that space has rapidly eclipsed the sophistication of both consumers and regulators. So those groups were caught flat-footed 
by the rise of vaping associated pulmonary injury this summer, first in the Wisconsin area and second in Kings County, California. And as things snowballed, they remained very reactive and cautious about what they thought they were seeing and what they thought it might be. And my sense is their actions were informed by learnings they had from past outbreaks. They are the government. They can't get out over their skis about what they think this is the way investigators in the media can or certainly armchair consultants or even industry experts. They had to go slow and have it be really evidence-based and be really systematic. And so they were kind of, they're kind of the last to say what people think it is. But that's how institutions work. Institutions are the slowest to come around to what empirical reality is telling us. And and we saw that writ large with the CDC response. I think the takeaway for a consumer is that no matter what the situation, you're going to be on your own during the first part of a new emergency. It doesn't matter if it's a fire or a flood or an earthquake or a hurricane or a mass injury event like this. They're less the centers for disease control than they are the centers for disease kind of reporting on what happened. And you're going to have to be making common sense decisions and be an active agent of your own health and welfare in real time and be prepared. And this, again, goes beyond a particular vector of injury in health. It applies to all of these sort of theatrical government agencies that are there to ride to the rescue in the movies, but in reality it's more complicated and messy and slower. Uh, and But what was really clear to me and one of the big takeaways is that the groups of experts gathering through the internet will always be ahead of the authorities on any particular emerging situation because just by nature of the world being so complex these days, there's going to be more experts out in the wild than there will ever be in like a building in the rural Pennsylvania right, or something. Right. With regard to the- you know, they, the CDC folks probably never go to Reddit. <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah. Um, I know you wanted to talk about this later, but one of the reasons why we were able to get that story together is because the CDC doesn't have people that have been on the cannabis beat understanding modalities and markets for years and years the CDC can't pick up the phone and call vape industry operators and be like, hey, what's new? What's different? Um, what's changed? What could be everywhere and in multiple products at once and have those operators go? I'll tell you, man, here's a couple things we've been wondering about and worrying about for a while. And, and you should look at these. Right, right. Well, all right, maybe this is a good time to get right into it. So what exactly did cause these injuries and how did you first learn about it? Well, I think two things you're going to see leafly right about in the future is one is that vaping associated pulmonary injury isn't new. The earliest documented case is from the year 2000, where a woman used a vitamin E oil extract formulation to hurt herself. Um, but they've been building in the case literature for a while. Uh-huh. And it's not just one thing. Vitamin E acetate, tocopherol acetate, is a major culprit. But, you know, you can think of it like the planet Jupiter. There's a bunch of satellite moons that are smaller than tocopherol acetate with the potential to cause harm in the near, medium, or long term. And all of that is going to come out in, like, in 2020. So... Starting in late last year, so late 2018 and ramping into 2019, the street market for THC vapes uh, began ramping up its use of a new thickening cutting agent that allows the people who make vape pens to make more money by stretching the supply of THC oil they have and fooling consumers who don't know the oil's been cut. And I suspect a lot of Dance Safe listeners are up to speed on the basic mechanics of this now. And we think this because we talked to industry experts who saw this happening. We tracked companies who introduced these products and marketed them. We have lab tests on their products and what was in them from health officials as well as independent labs. We have example in like in Wisconsin, a snapshot of the THC cart supply on the street in 2018 versus 2019 and the tocopherol acetate, the vitamin E oil in particular, cutting agent, just appearing in levels that comport with what our sources were telling us, which is that by mid 2019, up to 50 or 60 percent of the vaporizer cartridges on the street had vitamin E in them. Now, you're just talking THC, or are you talking CBD and nicotine as well? 
we don't see tocopherol acetate in nicotine jewel pods per se. The chemistry is different, so the utility is not there. But okay. what we do see is that the supply chain and the operators are the same. What's different is the active drug ingredient and the retail endpoint. And we've concluded that it's 10 times easier to get into the business of hurting people with a dirty CBD card or a nicotine jewel pod than it is to get into the business of hurting people with a THC vape cart, simply because it's even easier to get the active ingredients, nicotine or CBD, than it is to get THC, and thus there's less reason to cut. But again, you're going to be exposed to secondary and tertiary contaminants that can also cause lung injury beyond vitamin E acetate in THC vape carts. What are those other ingredients or risks that can cause injury besides the vitamin E acetate? Um, in no, late November, early December, uh, a paper came out about a woman who had symptoms of heavy metal lung exposure and injury, so-called cobalt lung, because of the type of immune cells they found in her lung and how it comported with that disease type. And then they also had her product, um, which I believe was called a Zen pen. And both the product and the vapor deposition from the Zen pen show this cobalt. So that's what I look for as a journalist. I look for, you know, an actual person who was harmed and a strong evidentiary chain showing what they were using, what was in it, how it got into their lungs and how it might have hurt them. In particular, the cobalt was probably coming off the coil. She was using a coil style vaporizer that runs electricity through the coil and heats it up because of resistance like a toaster. And the issue there is you can off-gas or degrade metal components of that coil. We know that the Chinese foundries that are making 95% of these vaporizer products have metals in their formulations that maybe we don't want there, whether it's cobalt or lead or some other really, really exotic ones. So those are two instances where we have a real clear evidentiary chain and proof of harm, tocopherol acetate and cobalt. Beyond that, we're tracking a whole wide variety of pesticides that are appearing in extremely high levels in street carts and correlating them to what they do to cells uh, when they're made into a gas and what the sort of short, medium, and long-term known effects of those pesticides are, especially when they're delivered through gases, because we have like case history of workers who've been exposed to these pesticides. or And these are pesticides that are being sprayed onto cannabis plants? Yeah. Um, but, but they don't get in your lungs when you smoke flour? They're only getting into people's lungs when they vape? The issue is we're in an era of the industrialization of cannabis and the application of advanced extraction techniques, much like you have canola oil or vegetable oil that's happening to the cannabis plant for the first time, yeah. really at a commercial level. And so you have fields of cannabis that have been sprayed heavily with really, really dangerous pesticides, malathion, mycobutanol, um, a bunch of other scary name stuff. And when you take that field and you extract it to make oil, you concentrate the good and the bad. So all concentrations do that. So there's a higher level of THC, but then there's a much higher level of the pesticides that were applied to those products. And we have strong evidentiary proof that, you know, a third or more of street weed and thus the oils that are derived from it have problematic levels of pesticides that you don't want to be burning and inhaling or just vaping and inhaling. Um, that's going to be a big vector of harm. All right, you're, uh, you're, you're blowing me away here because I really thought this uh, show is just going to be about vitamin E acetate. Now you're saying that really we are on, in the beginning of a new sort of industry and there are more risks than people may be aware of. Yeah, I'm calling this the kind of end of innocence for the age of innocence for vaping. And it was curious that people could really sit with the idea that there would be no long-term deleterious effects on their bodies if they're using this stuff or if they're, there might be inappropriate groups that should not be using it or right. um, inappropriate things that shouldn't be in there. You know, when I look at all the data, I conclude that vaping is going to be a modality that's with us forever. It's very useful and it can be very safe. It's we're going to conquer the stars with vapes. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> like all technology, powerful technology, you got to wield it correctly. And if you use it incorrectly or use it for ill, 
we found newfound potentials for harm. So a lot of old hippies are bereft that the long-standing truism that like cannabis can't kill you has been called into question because surely if you extract pesticide laden cannabis loaded in a cheap Chinese vape, cut it with uh, vegetable oil and terpenes and then sell it off the back of a truck and use it 72 times a day for four months, you, you might injure your lungs and a subset of people, um, it could be really bad for them. Okay, L let's take these things one at a time. Let's start with the vitamin E acetate because Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was what had caused these, was it nine fatalities that the media kept talking about? Um, what do we got? It's like we're at 2,200 cases of vaping-associated pulmonary injury and about 40 deaths. 40? And Yeah, nationwide. And a significant subset of those will likely be attributed to complications from inhaling tocopherol acetate vitamin E oil, right. viscous substance. Okay, so so has that disappeared or, or is it still being imported from China and added to vape pens now that the danger has been exposed and I'm assuming most people in the industry are aware of it now? We see the rates of new cases go down and down. The outbreak, or, and outbreak's the wrong word, the like injuries appear to have peaked in September and it's important that we use the right words because words matter. They influence the way we think about it and frames things. And even the CDC, I mean, they're called the Centers for Disease Control, and they've been talking about this as an outbreak, but this isn't a disease, and we didn't have an outbreak because outbreaks are related to the, this is a mass injury. This is mass poisoning. Right. This is like Bhopal in India or those Chinese babies that had the formula that had uh, chemicals in it that hurt them. History is rife with industrial mass poisonings, and indeed, the best metaphor for this is bathtub gin, where uh, we had a popularly demanded product, alcohol, suppliers that were selling adulterated versions of a distillation of alcohol, and in that case, tens of thousands of people died. Yeah. So, but back to your point, the injuries peaked in September, and they've been subsiding, and the CDC believes that the street market is reducing its use of vitamin E acetate as a cutting, thickening agent, a diluent thickener, and consumers have thrown those pens out. Maybe supplies of it aren't moving as much, but we certainly see it on sale in the stores in California to this day. We went to unlicensed stores in the LA area as well as went online to look at unlicensed stores advertising on weedmaps.com, and you can find the exact products implicated in the outbreak, dank vapes, and you can find, and we actually purchased those products and got them tested, the ones from trap shops in LA. Dank vapes, don't buy them then, right? Dank vapes is a street cannabis vape brand with no licensed real version of itself. It's a holy street preacher. Any one of us, you or I, could go into the business of making dank vapes today with access to a phone and a credit card. We could start buying the packaging from China, the hardware from China, the diluent thickeners and additives, and find a source for THC oil or some other drug active ingredient. A lot of times we're seeing synthetic cannabinoids be used and sell dank vapes. Dank vapes is a big, big red flag. Huh, so, would, so it's not a license. It's nobody patented dank vapes. It's just, uh, it's just a word out not there. Exactly. There's like a guy who tried to trademark it, and it's not clear if he's fam like affiliated with the people who are making and selling and marketing dank vapes online. It's a weird creature of 2019 where anybody can swap a digital file and put ink on cardboard right. and call themselves a brand. Right. So don't believe word ink on cardboard. You need more than that in life. You need third party verification of all claims. I mean, it's kind of like Mitsubishi ecstasy tablets or any other ecstasy brand. You can't tell by looking at it what's in it. It's a illicit market brand designed to convince you that it's good, but uh, you always have to test your drugs first. And that, that's what's happening here now on the cannabis market as well. Crazy. That's what that's a great way to bucket this is like, as long as there have been illegal drugs, there have been contaminated drugs. I mean, shoot, we sometimes have trouble with legal drugs that are contaminated. And this is that. 
This is long-standing issues with illicit drug contamination that have come to an ancient substance, cannabis, in a modern modality, vape pens. And it's here now. And for a long time, the risk equation for vapes seemed pretty benign. But why the media went wild in 2019 is because, like, almost overnight, the risk equation for vapes just inverted. It went from being something that might hurt you in the longest of terms you know, to something that could hurt you today. And from a media standpoint, that's obviously a very rich narrative. Right. And when you say a significant number of these are going to be correlated to black market vape pens with thickening agents like vitamin oil, are we saying 90%? And are we saying this is pretty much isolated to THC? So it's like, 90% THC, 10% CBD or nicotine. And the issue with those people is what were they really taking and are they being truthful? A lot of people, like people who said, I never touched THC. Well, they didn't give them like a P screen to confirm. And there's a huge stigma around admitting THC use if you're a youth or a member of society. So we know there's underreporting there. Um, But the injuries in the nicotine and CBD space comport with what we know about those supply chains, which is anybody can enter them. We've democratized the production of a medical device. And when you do that, and anybody can do this in their garage, statistically, people are going to get hurt. So what can people do to remain safe? Smoke flour, baby. No. Uh, um, well, like, so that that's great when it comes to cannabis. And I think uh, there's no reason anyone should switch from flour to uh, extracts with cannabis. But uh, there may be some reasons, right? But um, But when it comes to tobacco versus nicotine vape pens, a lot of people are switching because of the lower cancer risk or perhaps zero cancer yeah. risk with vaping nicotine. And what we tell them? Yeah, it's good to know that we're not seeing a lot of these uh, vapey injuries in yeah. the nicotine market. And and those, mar- those smokers or vapors will tell you, like, look at UK, look at Europe. They regulated electronic nicotine delivery systems. N Z N D S, which is what the FDA likes to call all this stuff, way ahead of us, as befitting the European culture of kind of regulation before innovation. And um, if you talk to people like Arno, who's on the ISO committee for vape standards, he'll tell you like every country goes through this, like a period of no vape regulation, a scare, really strong vape regulation, and then the strong sort of survive. And um, he thinks it's overdue for the U.S. For example, Colorado's going to ban MCT oil, tocopherol acetate, and PEG, polyethylene glycol, as an additives in vapes. And, you know, I asked Arno, like, good idea, bad idea? And he's like, yeah, long overdue for MCT oil and tocopherol acetate. You know, we know, um, we know about problems. You shouldn't be putting coconut oil on the inside of your lungs. I have a six-year-old, and he could tell you that's going to be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, are there... I guess I'm not asking you to uh, plug any particular brands, but what's the most important, like easy to follow advice if you do want to vape both nicotine and or THC CBD? Like, how how do you know that you're buying a safe pen? Yeah, yeah. I think everyone. um, So you don't buy meat or milk off the back of a truck in a bad, bad part of town. We have schemas for assessing quality. In California and other legalization states, you can stop shop at state licensed stores. And these supply chains have proven orders of magnitude more resilient to contamination. How do you know when it's a state licensed store versus a, a illegal store? Great question. Most states will have licensed lookup tools. You got to empower yourself to uh, use those lookup tools and ask and look for licenses. I will plug Leafly and say we only list licensed stores worldwide, and you can go there and look for stores around you. And if they're on Leafly, they're licensed. And that's unlike some of our competitors. It's a big selling point. It's kind of no-brainer to me. Right. In, in L.A., there's 189 licensed stores. The Department of Cannabis Regulation in L.A. has its own lookup tool. Use that one, L.A. This is a real hotbed of it. But the fact of the matter is, is a lot of people aren't in licensed states there's more people that aren't than are right one of my victims was in utah and he was from anchorage and he couldn't get flour in utah and he thought the dank vapes were safer 
And he was sucking down dank vapes and TKOs and roves, you know, by the dozen. And he, it nearly killed him. And I, that guy, the truth is, he can't, shouldn't use a vape in Utah. I wouldn't use a vape in Utah. Unless you snuck it out of California from a licensed store in, or in Nevada or Colorado, which again, or California, which is against the law, I, I wouldn't, you couldn't pass me a vape I would hit in a prohibition state right now. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. And there's like obviously tons of caveats and technicalities and people are going to take umbrage. But if you want to stay, if you want to really mitigate risk, you have to use products that come with third party verification. That's a third party saying, I've tested it. It's accurate to what the label says. In state licensed systems, the state runs the third party testing system via labs that are licensed to do the testing. And they have their problems, but they're way better than nothing. But your, your guy or your guy's guy or your cousin or some dude online or some on the dark web, these people do not count. They do not have a business you can sue in court and take all of their money when there's a liability issue. Um, they don't they don't have insurance, liability insurance when they're sued. <laughs> I wouldn't risk my life. Right. Like it's not about whether you can sue after you suffer severe injury. Right. You don't want to get that severe injury to begin with. Right. Yeah. And that's the fact. I mean, we got a lot of kids who are getting, you know, there's millions of vape carts, tens of millions of vape carts in America, and four and five of them are from unlicensed supply chains. And it's shocking how cavalier people have been and trusting people have been with something they're putting directly on their lungs, you know. And again, it's not, it's so much harder to contaminate raw cannabis if it's laden with pesticides or it's uh, mold or mildew, you will, you'll see it, it'll smell bad, it might look bad, it might taste bad, it might feel bad. But vitamin E acetate is designed to be colorless, odorless, virtually tasteless, and induce no choke or cough response. You inhale it deep into your lungs and it coats your lung surface fluid called lung surfactant and it interferes with this fluid such that the fluid can't transfer gases into your bloodstream and your immune system gets pissed off and if you keep doing it, one day your immune system just freaks out and it can do more damage to your body than the vitamin E oil itself because it's so rap it's so upset about this foreign substance that it can't get rid of. That's crazy. So this is really a prohibition related epidemic. No, what do we call it? Uh, mass injury. <laughs> it is uh, mass injury. Yeah. Mass poisoning. Yeah. Uh, just again, it's just like bathtub gin. I've, I realized that as long as until everyone's got a, a licensed supply of vapes, the way they have alcohol or most other regulated consumer products, even dairy, these like the injury numbers are going to keep going up. The acute injury numbers from contamination. Right. It reminds me of spice or K2 because a lot of people yeah. were choosing to use these synthetic cannabinoids because they didn't show up on drug tests. And in a similar yeah. way, vape pens, they don't smell. Uh, right. A cop or someone sees you, they might think you're just smoking nicotine, but That's you right. are putting yourself at a great risk in, in doing so because it's unregulated. Yep. These are the latest victims of kind of stigma and lack of access. I mean, everyone has free will and can choose what to put in their bodies, but it's happening in a context of people not wanting to smell, people not wanting to look stoned or have weed on them and all this other sort of stuff. And then the other thing is like, some people can't get flour right now. Uh, extracts have really taken over in the illicit market, I think because they're easier to move around and yep. they're more shelf stable. It's the iron law of prohibition. Have you heard that? The tendency to stronger products. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that's similar uh, to hash mm -hmm. back in the day or hard liquor during prohibition. That's very much this. It's, uh, it's like living through the history of unintended consequences from certain drug policies. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, let's shift a little bit then. You know, let's just give people this advice. Don't use illicit vape pens. And if you're in a state where it's not legal, 
travel out of state and sneak one back if you can, but four out of five pens are unregulated and you just don't know. And I guess there's no way to test yourself, all right? There's no dance safe testing kit that can positively identify vitamin E acetate. Maybe we can find something in the future to help people do I that. Can, yeah, I can verify any of these home test kits. Um, are there any? I are would, there actually some? I've heard reports of one or like a I've ever heard, you know, not really. I've heard reports of like some, there's certainly commercial labs are offering it now to licensees so they can screen their supplies. Um, uh -huh. But you can't test it at home. And that's a big thing for people to know is that you can change the color, taste, and viscosity of THC oil with various forms of chemistry. And indeed, home chemists are doing that all the time now to juice sales and encourage sales. So you can't use color, taste, or viscosity as a proxy for purity, which is how this whole thing got started. Yep. For in the beginning, there was THC oil plus vegetable glycerin or propylene glycol that was thinner than pure THC oil. People started doing the bubble test where they flip their pens around, see if the bubble moves. Hmm. The bubble inside the cart moves. They know that the pen oil is thin, which means it's cut, which means it's not that good. Vitamin E acetate was a direct response to that. One of the makers, Honeycut, the big producer, promised you could cut your tea soil by 60, 70, 80% and never fail the bubble test, quote unquote. People are still using viscosity as a proxy for purity in the streets. And like people biting gold with their, you know, back in the 49er days, like, is that gold? Ah, you know, you'd like bite it. Huh. You know, there's all these <laughs> subjective, qualitative human ways we've sort of come up with to assess the quality of something without a lab, right? Yeah, yeah. This isn't a. This isn't something you want to do that with. This is you're putting. You know, this is, maybe if you want to rub it on your elbow, you can uh, do a bubble test. But if you're putting it on your lungs, this like unique evolutionary adaptation that transfers gases to your bloodstream, you know, without gills or anything else, like. You, you don't want to experiment. Uh, right. too, too, you want to get too far ahead of, of what you're putting down there. All right. So it sounds like there's... And that, and that, important to, that brings up another point is like pot smokers have been smoking pot and filling out surveys for decades. And we know they have decreased risk of cancer if they don't use tobacco and they don't have higher rates of like COPD or emphysema or anything. We are of the opinion that smoking cannabis has been relatively benign from this like serious, you know, health issue point of view. We can't say the same for long-term use of extracts when they're adulterated. Yeah. So, all right, sounding like there's not much people can do to test themselves. So what do you know is happening now, especially in light of all these new revelations, in terms of state regulation? Are the feds, are states, you talked a little bit about California. How are we going to stop the illicit vape pen industry? Like, what's happening in terms of regulation now? Gosh, there's a lot of questions. In general, states are going to be ramping up their additives regulations in 2020. Colorado is going to lead the way. You know, Washington and Oregon are following behind them. California behind them. And uh, this has been a wake-up call that these regulatory agencies need to think like a thief to catch a thief. They need to be proactive about what people are doing in the streets and threats to their legal supply chain by innovation and chicanery. You know, this isn't going to stop. There's going to be a new diluent thickener in 2020 that someone thinks is safe and cool and novel because the profit motive isn't going in a way and the structures that create that profit aren't going away. There's going to be an illicit market. Most people aren't going to be an illegal one. The people are going to want to make money and there's going to continue to be these pressures on supplies such to create the desire to cut. So people are going to be looking for cutters and regulators are going to have to be smarter about who's doing the cuts. And there's a lot of homework that existing legalization states still have to do around pesticides. Washington's basically flying blind. Oregon's watcher. No one's watching the watchers in Oregon. And there's just basic stuff that needs to be cleaned up around, for example, even legal supplies of like legal pesticides can cause allergies in your lungs. If you're a real, like one in a million people can't inhale neem oil, it's legal to put on plants, but it's as a teractin, it's a plant oil. And I don't know about you, but I'm allergic to rosehip oil. You put that on my skin and my skin freaks out. Who knows why? It's plant oil. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. 
these existing states got a lot of homework to do and catching up to do. The black market's going to stay dirtier than it's ever been. There's these forces that are pushing things to either side. The illegal stuff's cleaner than it's ever been, and the street stuff's never been dirtier. The old huh. sort of reputation-based medical distribution networks of the past are gone. They've been replaced by rapacious, independent, profit-driven actors at every stage in the supply chain. And they're just dumping it on really clueless consumers who are just chasing news points they're hearing about using cannabis for pain and anxiety and a lot of other stuff. And lastly, we're going to see a newfound focus on terpenes in 2020. They're the aromatic compounds in cannabis. They really modulate the high and make cannabis great. But it looks like there's such thing as too much of a good thing with regard to terpenes. With modern science, you can fractionate the terpenes off from the rest of the cannabis oil and then add them back later or use non-cannabis-derived terpenes in your products. And the danger is that when you inhale higher concentrations of terpenes that are found in nature, there's the potential to create byproducts or just create medium and long-term exposure hazards because you're just doing something that never existed before. Human beings have never inhaled 17% limonene chronically ever before. And I don't think you want to be the, like, test case for that. Yeah. So, you know, um, there is such thing as too much of a good thing of anything. Moderation and all things remains uh, the order of the day and, and skepticism. Well, moderation has always been Dan Safe's uh, motto. You know, I, I just I can't repeat enough how blown away I am. Everyone got caught off guard with this. I mean, I've been a drug policy reform activist for decades, and, and we just all thought, legalize this shit and everything's going to be okay, right? Am I wrong? Nobody anticipated these kinds of problems with legalization, right? We, we Even a drug as safe as cannabis, we need to heavily regulate it. Every drug needs to be regulated differently and carefully depending on its unique and specific risks. And even cannabis is proving now that it, an, in an illegalized, unregulated market, there's going to be big problems. Yeah, uh, it strikes me that we're in a generations-long reckoning with quality control in the cannabis supply chain. We knew we had a problem. We've seen it develop and we've seen the drip, drip, drip. This summer was the summer that the simmering issues were really brought to a boil, but uh, we're going to be spending the better part of a generation delineating and isolating and removing stuff from the, the cannabinoid supply chain that we don't want there. And ultimately it's productive and it has to happen and the products will get cleaner and safer and consumers are going to get more sophisticated. But when you're living in the middle of it, it's very disorienting. Yeah. Well, is there anything you want to say that we haven't uh, discussed yet? You know, people um, want to talk about conspiracy theories and big tobacco and scaring people away from nicotine dripping. And like sitting where I'm sitting, I see disorganization. I don't see coordination around messaging. Certainly um, some people who are in the anti-tobacco camp used this poisoning event to advance things they've been wanting to advance around tobacco flavorings and, and vaping flavorings for a while. That's going to continue in 2020. The anti-tobacco people have vaping in their sites. They consider it the new tobacco and cannabis right behind it. And they don't really want to talk about the science and the relative safety of cannabinoids or vaping. They want to lean on more of a conservative approach to the rollout of these products. But I don't see conspiracy type stuff and the international picture is going to be totally crazy. There's going to be sort of superficial addressing of the fact that you can get vitamin E oil by the 40 pound drum online and 5,000 vape carts shipped to your condo. But this is a story of globalization as much as any other. And this reality isn't going to go away. International supplies of this stuff available digitally through digital markets is, is sort of here to stay. Consumers are just basically going to have to have the option of something cleaner. And the consumers moving toward clean supplies is just going to drain the impetus for there to be an illicit market down from where it is today. You know, the illicit markets don't come first. The demand comes first. And so as the demand for illicit products go down because supplies and legal ones go up, the market should, should sort of reduce. But I just want people to use common sense, use their dance safe sense, and, you know, remember sort of the basics about putting their health first and, you know, not trusting people you don't know and sticking with what we know is relatively safe versus branching out. Because this, this is the new era we live in. 
you know, someone's going to have something new and safe for you to try on the internet for every day for the rest of the time you're alive. <laughs> but uh, the chances that it's actually new or safe or something you want to try, you know, probably right. not that big. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for what you do. I think you're leading the educational campaign around this, and hopefully there will be more people getting involved locally in their state governments to regulate the vaping industry and keep people happy and healthy. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Manuel. Take care. Okay. Make healthy decisions. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. <laughs>